Aggression isn't just a dog thing, of course. It's normal behavior in many species, and I'm delighted to chat with Dr. Eddie Fernandez for this episode about the whys of aggression from an evolutionary perspective in a variety of animals, including dogs, hippos, walruses, and even penguins. Eddie does a great job of breaking down aggression from a variety of different scientific perspectives, and I'm sure you'll find this episode enlightening. Dr. Fernandez received his PhD in psychology with a minors in neuroscience and animal behavior from Indiana University and his master's in science and behavior analysis from the University of North Texas. Much of his past and current research involves the behavioral training and welfare of zoo, aquarium, and companion animals. He's currently a senior lecturer of applied animal behavior and welfare in the School of Animal and Veterinary Sciences at the University of Adelaide in Australia. And if you are enjoying the bitey end of the dog, you can support the podcast by going to aggressivedog.com, where there are a variety of resources to learn more about helping dogs with aggression issues, including the upcoming Aggression and Dogs Conference, happening from September 29th through October 1st, 2023, in Chicago, Illinois, with both in person and online options. You can also learn more about the Aggression and Dogs Master Course, which is the most comprehensive course available anywhere in the world for learning how to work with and help dogs with aggression issues. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Bitey End of the Dog. I have another special guest with me this week. Dr. Artie Fernandez is joining us. And we're going to be approaching things from a multidisciplinary perspective, which is what I love about this season. We've had a lot of folks with multiple degrees after their name. And Eddie is certainly one of those where he's dabbling in a few things like ABA, psychology, animal welfare, among a number of other things. So really super excited about this episode. So welcome to the show, Eddie. Hi. How's it going? <laughs> Doing wonderful. It's great to have you. Yeah, this is going to be great. And, and since we're talking about aggression during this podcast, of course, I would love to hear from your multidisciplinary perspective, how you define aggression, because it's a question I ask a lot of different people and I get a lot of different answers, including myself. So how do you define right. it? Right. And I, and I always like to throw out the caveat here that I do some observations. I've done research involving aggression, but not directed at aggression. I've looked at a, a few different species where I'm looking at some type of typically conspecific activity. So, you know, a polar bear and whether it aggresses towards another polar bear. That may be included in an ethogram that I'm observing. It's also, I guess, worth mentioning, since we've now mentioned that, I do a lot of work with a lot of different species, and I work with a lot of zoos, aquariums, as well as companion animals. And a lot of that is really welfare focused. So applied animal behavior, my title is actually a senior lecturer of applied animal behavior and welfare. So that gives you an idea of what I do. So now that I danced around your question there, how I define aggression usually is I don't worry about intent. I'm talking about the action. I don't think about intent. So what does it look like? And I think of aggression as some type of generally maladaptive behavior directed at, a, at another individual, conspecific or, or other, right? So we could heterospecific or conspecific. And I'm generally thinking about it as some type of action. So something I can directly observe. The only component of that is that maladaptive part that gets a little tricky. So it's something that I am at least throwing on some interpretation of this is damaging in some way to the other individual. In terms of maladaptive, can you just define that a little further for anybody that might not might kind of be new to that term? Yeah, yeah, this is why this gets a little tricky. So I'll give my simplified version of this. It's problematic to the welfare of that individual. So that's what I would say. It's either uh, physiologically or behaviorally damaging to that individual in some way, right? So it's either going to leave a bruise or it's going to make that animal go away and do something we would less like them to do. So there's the physiological and the behavioral part. That's what I would say about maladaptive in that way. But I'm taking a very pragmatic and proximate approach. So by pragmatic, I just mean practical here. Hey, what is happening in the now right now for that animal? And how is that a problem for it? 
Yeah, and and it's interesting because hearing your definition, you don't you don't pull out any specific behaviors because when you're looking at multi species, we might be looking at all kinds of different behaviors or actions or body parts being used、yeah. uh, when we're talking about aggressive behavior, right? So am I am kind of accurate there in saying that that's why you don't pick out like it's not just biting; it could be many other things depending on the animal. Yeah, absolutely, and and this is why I leave off things like intent, and I'm looking at the observable behavior instead. Aggression in well, let's take one of my favorite species, a penguin, or favorite orders, really, for all 18 of the species. For most of the penguins, they have two ways they tend to aggress in some way, which is with their beak or with their wings. So they do this wing flap. And which, by the way, is incredibly adorable when you have a little penguin or a fairy penguin, the smallest of them. I used to go into exhibits with them, and at places like Cincinnati Zoo, where I would actually try to get them to aggress towards me because they'll grab your finger with their beak and start. Smacking their wing. I'm doing the action here that Mike can see, but nobody else can see. They'll start trying to smack their wing into your hand. So those are typically the two types. Now that's not as adorable when it's something like a king penguin. So a meter high or three foot high penguin that is literally trying to jam its beak into your flesh, or if it slaps you with one of those wings, you feel it. Like if you're walking by a king penguin and it didn't like that you walked by it, it slaps you. By the way, there's a great one of the older. There's a statistics text. I thought they showed this in in a psychology text as well that shows emperor penguins, the biggest of all of them, where they're all maintaining a wing distance away from each other,、sure. and that's part. So we see immediately one of the the important functions of that behavior, which is determining the space. Where that penguin resides,、mm. so they all stay that wing distance. You know, you can't hit me, I can't hit you, with a wing. So that's aggression in penguins, but it can look very different. Boy, I've had a lot of different species aggress towards me. Fortunately, with and here's a word I'm going to define in a little bit, but in protected contact, I've had gorillas.、Uh, I've had a silverback gorilla aggress towards me, which was. Tremendously,、uh, I think many people have had some form of aggression, but I, I had the the full extent of a, a, a silverback gorilla charged me in the night enclosure area, so behind the the public scene, and it it leapt into the bars. So protected contact, meaning there's a barrier between me and the gorilla. <laughs> Thank goodness for that. Yep. <laughs> right. As opposed to free contact, where there is no barrier, it sent the bars rattling that it leapt into with its shoulder,、um, and and we could talk about some of the antecedents and the consequences of that behavior as well, because all of that's important for the function. Part of the antecedent happened to be that he was there with a with. A couple of of the female gorillas, and I happened to walk in. He didn't know who I was. I, this gorilla was known to be pretty aggressive, and I walked in、mm. with a woman with me, so a female that he also didn't recognize. So he immediately charged me, kind of looked me up and down, and、uh, it was an interesting experience. Very different than penguin aggression, <laughs>、yeah. right? And same with、yeah. a, a lion. Again, protected、mm-hmm. contact that I've had, and under very similar antecedent. Conditions where I happened to be with a couple research assistants that were female. This male lion was around a couple female lions in this exhibit in Texas, and he did a full charge at me. The difference there with lions is they don't typically run into things like that. He just did a full run at me and then stopped right at the end of the fence, which was still terrifying. Um, to have a lion actually charge you, regardless of the number of barriers you have between you, so we can talk about the topography. Nice fancy word to say what this visually looks like, the aggression, and it can be very different across the different species that we're talking about. Often very different. So people like Nico Tinbergen talked about aggression in sticklebacks. These little fish that he spent a lot of time studying and looking at what that territorial aggression is that they displayed. Well, that's going to look very different than a penguin or a gorilla or a lion. A lot of different topographies. 
Yeah. So let's jump back to the function there. So, we, yeah. you know, because we've kind of talked about how it's going to look different depending on the species when we're talking about aggressive behaviors. But what's right. the what's the function? Is it similar for all species or what? Do, how do you get into that topic? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're getting into the really interesting. I think this to me is what fascinates me the most when I think about behavior on any level. And this is where we come to another part that we have to define that I think is important. So Nico Timbergen, who I just mentioned and who spent a lot of time studying sticklebacks among many other species, gulls and, and wasps and, and other species, well-known ethologist, Nico Timbergen. So he in 63 came up with his four whys of animal behavior. Why does the animal behavior occur? And I'm not going to jump into too much detail of that. I think the important difference here is that he talked about many different, it's not just one reason, but we can talk about different approaches we take to understanding why this behavior occurs. And the big distinction he made, what can classify those four questions into two broader categories, are the proximate or the learned reasons. So the stuff happening at the individual level, the stuff, the ontogeny, ontogenetic aspects of the behavior. And then the ultimate or the evolved, the phylogenetic or phylogenic aspects of that behavior. So we can think of why does an animal do something based on what it learned as an individual or what it experienced as an individual, because learning is one component of that. And we can also talk about why does an animal do that because of what it's evolved to do as a species. So across those different animals and then within the lifetime of the animal. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I, the words I use there, proximate for that stuff happening in the now for the individual and the ultimate being the species level, the evolved stuff. So you'll hear me often talk about learning versus evolutionary histories or I'll talk about mm -hmm. the individual versus the species, right? And by the way, I'm not going to make a big separation here, but Tinbergen did talk about cause versus function, using cause typically to identify more of the proximate stuff and function to identify more of the ultimate or evolved stuff. I'm not going to bother because mm -hmm. behavior analysts and behaviorists in general, and I come from a strong behavioral training background as well and teach things like applied behavior analysis with animals here in Australia. I use function to identify as all behaviors do. We talk about the function of some behavior to mean what's been learned. So I'm going to use function and cause interchangeably as many behaviorists do. Boy, that was a lot of fancy stuff that I threw out there to get at this, this, this one bit where we're coming down to. So here's the main point. The things that we can look at when we think about aggression or any behavior, we can think about what is being learned, what has been learned, what's being learned at that moment, and also what components of it have been evolved. What have they've gotten from being a species, right? So we already talked about different ways that different species aggress. Well, that's a pretty good indication that that has to do with the evolutionary history. If it's something that happens across the species, pretty pretty similar within the species and different across different species, probably tells us something about the evolutionary history. But now we can talk about the stuff happening that they learn from that, right? And the big one, and I think this is where we see a lot of stuff talked about, is what happens immediately? What are the consequences for engaging in aggression? Well, one of those, and this is something behavior analysts have spent quite a bit of time talking about, is that by engaging in aggression, you make some aversive stimulus, some stimulus you did not want present, go away, right? So if somebody's being annoying, right? If I have a dog that's barking near me and, and I don't by, by no means, so I want to make it sound like I'm promoting this, but we see this happen. This is something that, that people do. So you might see somebody, the dogs barking, 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 and someone might yell or even physically contact, hit the dog and the barking stops. Well, that aggression that the person has exhibited has now been negatively reinforced. 
So those are the proximate immediate, those are the consequences involved, and those are the behavioral contingencies. But then we can talk about some of the things, the types of aggression that are important, like I've already mentioned. So we can sum up those four whys that Tinbergen had to really the two big ones, which are the proximate and ultimate functions of some behavior. And by the way, they work beautifully interchangeably. I think what we see a lot of time is people tend to say, well, it's one or the other, or they focus only on one, and they actually work very beautifully together. It's I often use the analogy of you think about something like a race car, right? And if I were to stop and say, well, what makes that race car go so fast? Is it the engine or the form of the body? And my answer would be, it's not going to go fast. In fact, it's not going to go anywhere without both of those, mm-hmm. right? Both are required. They both handle different aspects of why it's able to to be a race car. So, yeah. So I want to dig a little deeper into the evolutionary aspect. And you had mentioned like in terms of a species, when we look at dogs, we can argue that it's one of the most diverse species on the planet in terms of the breeds and what we've selected for. So really not a question, but your thoughts around you know, like we have certain dogs, like let's use livestock guardian dogs that might use aggression to protect their flock or Belgian Malinois. I use Belgian Malinois all the time, but we know that they're, they have a higher likelihood for protecting somebody or something because we've selected for that in the breeding process. Sure. So thoughts around that in terms of, is that, would we consider that evolutionary or would that be more approximate in what we're doing in the you know individual level, breeding level? So what are, your, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, well, you're getting into something that is really interesting topic for ethologists, for evolutionary theorists, for behavioral ecologists. And I am neither, I'm an applied ethologist as one of the things that I happen to be of, of the different things. I do applied ethological work, but I am not an evolutionary theorist. So I'm getting into a little bit of dangerous territory <laughs> in, in describing some of this. That's my caveat of saying, let me say I'm going to be cautious in what I'm saying. So you're talking about a selection pressure now, and I like that you mentioned that's it's great that you talked about what's being selected, because now we're talking about artificial selection right? Which is a different type of selection pressure. Artificial selection is how we've domesticated plants and animals, right? It's through this selection. We decide we are the ones that are somehow involved in selecting those organisms, who's breeding, who doesn't. So that's the selection pressure. That's artificial selection. It does some really interesting things. As we know, if we look at across the different dog breeds and the variability across all the breeds, we see such different forms, right? From big giant dogs that we've selected for to tiny little dogs. And that includes some of the variability in behavior. So when we start getting into behavior and what that means for behavior, this is where it gets, I think, considerably trickier. And what I always say in understanding, I mean, there's certainly considerable differences across breeds in in terms of how they behave, including aggression. We should see that, right? This artificial selection pressure has imposed a number of things that are going to affect behavior. Some of that is genetic, which I know almost nothing about when it comes to genetics. And some of that can even be based on the morphology of what we're selecting for, right? Mm -hmm. So you select a little little dog, start producing this tiny little animal, they're probably going to aggress differently than something that's much bigger. So we may see more barking as opposed to biting. I don't know. But that's the big one that I like to throw out here is I don't know. There's so much variability that we see that I'm always – cautious and at least a little bit skeptical. And by skeptical, I mean skeptical from a scientific perspective. I do not mean cynical. I mean, I want to see the data. So I'm always at least a little skeptical when somebody says, well, this is what these breeds do. Because all I know is that there's there's quite a bit of variability still that exists. And we've seen some of the research recently 
that's been published looking at some of these things. In fact, there's that big paper in science <laughs> that Heckman was involved with that talked about the variability in the behaviors within a breed. That wasn't to say there's not predictors, there's not things that are more or less common across breeds, but it is saying that it's nowhere near as static as I think we've sometimes yeah. treated it. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So jumping back to the multi-species perspective again here, and your thoughts on you know, if you look at animals, let's say in captive environments versus more f naturally occurring, I, I don't know if I'm choosing the right words, but you have experience yeah. with both. So you, you've studied animals in the wild, sure. you've studied animals in, in zoo yeah. environments, you know about domestic yeah. dogs, probably free roaming dogs or streeties as we might adorably call them. But so your thoughts there, I mean, how much, yeah. you know, like we see, and a conversation I have often too, and I've had it with some of the other guests on this show is, you know, how much are we benefiting animals or not? And how much does it affect their behavior in certain environments? You know, so if we look at many streeties or street dogs, we don't see sometimes the profound or overt aggressive responses that we might see in dogs that are, you know, in the home or, or that are held captive and cer certainly in, in very impoverished and low enrichment environments. So your thoughts around that in terms of, yeah. especially when it comes to aggressive behaviors? Yeah, this is tough. And, and I have very, very little experience with any street dogs, with dogs under those conditions. But I do have a lot of experience in understanding the effects of captivity on other species, on quite a diversity of different species, understanding what are some of the welfare needs, for instance, in zoo environments, and then in homes as well, and understanding what some of those needs are. This is a really tricky question. It's a difficult one to answer is what are the effects of, just like trying to answer what are the effects of domestication, now we're asking what are the effects of captivity? And what is the difference between, say, a tiger bred in captivity and a wild tiger, tiger in, in its natural environment? which there's not a lot of wild, unfortunately, left for many tigers these days. But what is the difference? Well, some people have tried to look at this with different species. There's, there's been some interesting studies with rats and mice. There was some research done a number of years ago that they were taking rats bred for generations in captivity and then bringing them back into the wild. And the rats ended up adapting fairly quickly. Likewise, in zoos, there's a lot of work done for we talk about the, the species survival plans, breeding, and so propagation and reintroduction. Those are nice fancy words for saying we're going to breed you in the zoo and then we're going to release you back into the wild. And there's a lot of stuff that's been done along those lines. Really, some of the, the best conservation efforts that zoos have been involved in have helped protect things like the black-footed ferret, the golden lion tamarind. Those are both species that would be extinct if it weren't for these breeding programs. Well, Devra Kleinman who was one of the primary researchers involved with golden lion tamarins and breeding them in captivity and then releasing them into the wild in Colombia. I highly encourage people to look at some of the, if you're interested in this topic, look at some of the, the challenges that they faced. I've published one study with golden lion tamarins, but nothing in relation to a reintroduction program or anything like that. Deborah Kleiman is who really, through National Zoo in, in Washington, D.C., did amazing work with getting these gold mine tamarins bred in captivity and released in the wild. And they had a lot of failures to begin with, potentially because what it looked like were some of these tamarins were being released into the wild and then being pretty easily predated on. So that was one of the experiences is all of a sudden, I would somewhat facetiously say it was like we were homeschooling mm. gold mine tamarins and then taking them to New York City and giving them like cab fare and being like, okay, good luck, <laughs> right? So yeah. we breed them here in this captive condition. They have little to no experience with predators. And then we take them in a box and release them in Colombia. So it's not quite that simple. I'm oversimplifying how this process, but it did take a number of iterations and it took a while to figure out what was important. What did they need? What were the experiences that helped promote better survival in the wild? 
And every species is going to be different at some level. So there's a lot that contributes to this. It's hard to say. I can't give you a simple answer to what is really the difference between the wild and captivity. Mm -hmm. What I would say is, so these are experiences we can quantify in some way. And I think it's the research that helps us understand that. And there's certainly been a lot of looking at domestication itself. There is the fox project that was done uh, in Russia, right? The silver foxes and looking at domesticating those individuals over decades of research that they looked at what happens to their behaviors. I don't know a ton about that research like the details, but for listeners that might be interested, it's a lot of really cool stuff that was done with trying to understand domestication. Mm. So the best answer I can give is that it's tricky. It's yeah. very, very yes. tricky. Yeah. We have to understand as much as we can about the behavior in relation to the environment. Yeah, I can see it's just so difficult to study because, you know, getting that data is there's a lot of <laughs> issues, yeah. I'm sure, with seeing, especially when you start talking about other species. Because one of the things that dog trainers and behavior consultants often think about when we're drawing information from people that work with other species or from the zoo world is the problematic behaviors that occur from lack of enrichment. Yeah. So sometimes maladaptive aggression or, so can you talk more about that? I think it's a pretty well-known topic in the dog training community, but maybe there's some listeners that'd be more interested in hearing your take on what happens, stereotypic behaviors, like what, what's the yeah. problem with lack of enrichment or, or an animal that's not receiving, you know, what they need. Yeah, yeah. I have, by the way, I, I, I have a, a few papers. I've talked a little bit about the history of enrichment. This happens to be, uh, I, thank you for asking this, because this is one of my specialties. <laughs> so we're getting into stuff that I really know quite a bit about, which is great. It makes me feel a little unsafer <laughs> ground in talking about this. Um, so I've written a few papers, and I published a few papers. Some of those are open access papers talking about some of the history of enrichment. So I'm going to really simplify this in saying how Markowitz is one of the big people in the 70s and 80s. He's the father of enrichment, of environmental enrichment, where it got its start in zoos and providing these opportunities. He thought about this actually originally as learning contingencies, as operant contingencies. Mm -hmm. So he thought about this as a form of behavioral engineering. So enrichment started as a behavior analytic endeavor, as a Skinnerian endeavor. And that's something that people often don't realize. So really important to acknowledge some of those. And how Markowitz was doing things like giving an animal an opportunity to interact with its environment. So if it did something like chase this artificial prey, it would receive a consequence for engaging in that. So it'd get a reinforcer for, might get a treat for chasing that prey item. So he did that with servals in San Francisco Zoo. Some of this was very artificial, very contrived. He had mandrills competing against the public in an arcade-like game at the <laughs> Portland Metro Park Zoo in Oregon Zoo. So I always love this example, even though it's it, this, we're talking mid to late 70s when this was happening. So it's good to keep that historical context in mind because I, I would never imagine doing something like this now, how artificial, how contrived, how much of a, it's not natural for the animal. But it had beneficial effects. There were paramandrels. And mandrels are a baboon-like primate, very colorful butts. So that's what you think of with the mandrel. It's like a baboon with an extremely colorful butt. Boy, I just gave the, like, I just explained a, a mandrel to uh, my mother, I feel like. That was a, <laughs> if she were asking me that, my, my my old Cuban mother, it's like, what is a mandrel? You'd be like, it's it's a baboon with a really colorful butt, mom. Picture comes right to mind when you say that. So perfect, perfect description. <laughs> I also, it, that was just a very tiny bit of, of my, my mother impersonation there, the old Cuban. You know? <laughs> what is baboon? So anyway, uh, we'll, we'll move away from that. <laughs> and so... He had these games and there was this board. This was an electromechanical device. There was one on the end of the enclosure on the inside for the mandrel, and there was one on the outside for the public. And it was a reaction game. So it had a, a light 
and you had to move your hand from one light to the other to the other. And you had to try to do that as quickly as you could when it would light up. Mm -hmm. So it was a a time reaction game, and there was a sign in front of it that said, can you beat the monkey? Uh, or something like that. Can you beat the drill, the man drill? So people would walk up and they'd go, oh, this is silly, you know, and they'd drop their, it's, again, keep in mind, this is mid to late 70s. Mm-hmm. They dropped their nickel in. So that's how much it would cost. It was a nickel to drop that into the machine and the baboon would immediately beat them, <laughs> the man drill. Typically, the male man drill is who participated. And by the way, he published this, I think, Yanofsky and Markowitz, 1978. You already know, Mike, how much I like to say references here and, <laughs> and talk about this. It's also in Markowitz, 1978, in one of his first papers describing this. So people would get beat by this mandrel and they'd start digging out more nickels. Like, I need more nickels. And they'd sit there and drop <laughs> nickels in until they could beat the mandrel. That was a behaviorally engineered endeavor for the mandrel. So in that Yanofsky and Markowitz paper, they talked about reductions in aggression, of all things. Mandrels, by the way, are incredibly – all of the baboons can show some incredible amounts of aggression among the primates. And they saw reductions in aggression as a result of them engaging in this arcade-like game. That was, by definition, a type of enrichment. And we see some of this stuff now. When I used to work with Sophia Yin and and we – Boy, a decade and a half ago, we published our our paper that was the result of developing the treat and train, right? We made the treat and train for Sharper Image, what became the Manners Minder. And that was Sophia and I spending a bunch of time planning that out and thinking of all the things that, you know, we were consultants for Sharper Image. So that paper is Yin Fernandez, it's, et cetera, et cetera. So it's Yin et al., 2008. Wow. We published that in Applied Animal Behavior Science. And that was one of the goals was we wanted to deter some of these problematic behaviors. The main behavior we focused on was getting rid of some of these dogs darting out the front door, jumping on people when they arrived, barking at the door. So when the dogs would be able to hear the doorbell or somebody coming to the property, or somebody knocking at the door, the owner could give the cue for the dog to go sit on the mat in front of the treat and train and then sit there and deliver the treats remotely. Like Markowitz's devices, it's a remote feeding device and we had a little remote control that you could press and and the food would drop out of it. The pet tutor is a far more advanced version these days and we actually have a paper under review looking at using pet tutors in shelters and delivering food rewards to as a way to enrich. So all of these are, are ways of thinking about enrichment, of enriching animal lives. And typically, there's two big components that I like to say about enrichment that are important. One is enrichment is an interaction. It's not a thing. I think we all fall in this habit of treating enrichment as a thing where we go, oh, I'm giving the dog enrichment, right? I'm giving the polar bear enrichment. I'm giving the mandrel enrichment. But we have to see a change in behavior. It's an interaction. It's a contingency. So we have to see some effect on behavior. As I will say, it's not enrichment until it enriches. So we have to see an enriched effect for something to be defined as enrichment. So that's one important part. And then the other part, and the reason why I love enrichment so much is because speaking of that nice meshing between learning and evolution, you have to think about all of those components. So how is the individual going to interact with these things? And then what are some of the reasons why that individual would interact with those things, right? So if I'm giving some felid, some type of cat species, whether it's a serval or a leopard, whatever the the felid is that I'm working with, if I'm giving them something to chase, okay, that's probably going to work better as enrichment for those individuals than it would be necessarily if I started uh, dangling some artificial prey in front of a sloth, 
right in front yeah. of us three three toed <laughs> sloth probably not going to be yeah. so uh, beside aside from the fact that they don't predate but we're taking into account their evolutionary history mm. we're taking into account their species what have they evolved to do and that's important for evolution what have they evolved to do and then how will the individual learn to do those things what a beautiful meshing of evolutionary and learning histories mm. I have so many questions and I want to jump into a little <laughs> bit more into the enrichment, but I also yeah. want to jump into yeah. aggressive baboons and some of that stuff. So um, <laughs> I'm going to take a short break to hear a word from our sponsors and we'll be right back to talk about those things. Hey friends, it's me again, and I hope you are enjoying this episode. You may have figured out that something I deeply care about is helping dogs with aggression issues live less stressful, less confined, more enriched, and overall happier lives with their guardians. Aggression is so often misunderstood, and we can change that through education, like we received from so many of the wonderful guests on this podcast. In addition to the podcast, I have two other opportunities for anyone looking to learn more about helping dogs with aggression issues, which include the Aggression in Dogs Master Course and the Aggression in Dogs Conference. If you want to learn more about the most comprehensive course on aggression taught anywhere in the world, head on over to aggressivedog.com and click on the Dog Pros tab and then the Master Course. The course gives you access to 23 modules on everything from assessment to safety to medical issues to the behavior change plans we use in a number of different cases, including lessons taught by Dr. Chris Pockel, Kim Brophy, and Jessica Dolce. You'll also receive access to a private Facebook group with over a thousand of your fellow colleagues and dog pros all working with aggression cases. After you finish the course, you'll also gain access to a private live group mentor session portal with me, where we practice working through cases together. And if you need CEUs, we've got you covered. We're approved for just about every major training and behavior credential out there. This is truly the flagship course offered on aggression in dogs, and it's perfect for pet pros that want to set themselves apart and take their knowledge and expertise to the next level, or even for pet guardians who are seeking information to help their own dog. And don't forget to join me for the fourth annual Aggression in Dogs Conference, which is happening online and in person from Chicago, Illinois, September 29th through October 1st, 2023. This year's lineup includes many of the amazing guests you might have heard on the podcast, including Sue Sternberg, Dr. Tim Lewis, Dr. Christine Calder, Sindor Pangal, Cyrus Streming, Sean Will, Masa Nishimuta, and many, many more. Head on over to AggressiveDog.com and click on the Conference tab to learn more about the exciting agenda on everything from advanced concepts and veterinary behavior cases to working with aggression in shelter environments and even intra-household dog-dog aggression. And I wanted to take a moment to thank one of our sponsors for the conference. As a family of world-class trainers, Fenzy Dog Sports Academy provides expert and accessible instruction for competitive dog sports using the most progressive training methods and positive reinforcement techniques. Through their online platform, students are able to access professional dog training no matter your location or pup's skill level. FDSA believes the bond between the dog and human is a proud and life-changing partnership, and they'll work with you to develop a respectful and kind relationship with your furry best friend. Check out FDSA at FenzyDogSportsAcademy.com. All right, we're back here with Eddie Fernandez. We're talking about a lot. We just got a, a really nice overview of enrichment and why it's important. Some of the things that are happening, Eddie, is that we see trainers, they're focusing almost exclusively on enrichment and the concept of enrichment yeah. in helping dogs with behavior issues. So they often recognize that a particular behavior problem, I'll label it that as a behavior problem. It's really not sure. a problem, but it's you know problematic for the client that they're solving many of these issues with just straight enrichment. So not even sometimes looking at the ABCs, they're just like, this dog is needing some increased enrichment. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? Like you're seeing that sometimes uh, happening in other places, it, it, not in just the dog training industry, or, or you think that's a really important concept for us to focus more on in the dog training industry? 
Yeah, yeah. Um, and again, I always love to throw out caveats. I think you know this as well. <laughs> as much as I like to throw out references, Mike, I like to throw out caveats. I like to say, I mean, I, I am not a dog trainer, right? I'm an academic. I want your listener to keep that in mind that I'm a scientist. I'm a welfare researcher. Even though I've done practice in the past, I've worked including with companion animals. I am not, a, I do not consider myself a practitioner. I'm a scientist. So it's always worth taking what I say with at least a little bit of grain of salt. I think everything is good taken with a, <laughs> with a grain of salt that we be skeptical, we be empirical, we look for that evidence. So that said, what I would say is enrichment is a really powerful tool, but we still need to consider what are the necessary components to manage behavior right? So we still need to think about how is this animal interacting with its environment? What's some of the proximate functions of that behavior? What are some of the consequences that they're receiving that will increase or decrease that behavior, be likely to increase? Those are the behavior analytic components that we normally think of. And it's hard to think of a more powerful tool than operant conditioning for managing behavior. To think about all of the ways in which the the potential reinforcement or punishment contingencies are involved. What trainers sometimes call the quadrants, although Eileen Anderson has a really wonderful article about this. This is quadrants is a trainer specific term. It's not doesn't really come from the behavior analytic scientific community, but it's still a nice way of summarizing what it means to think about those different contingencies and how they maintain behavior. And enrichment isn't, even though it came from that historical background, even though that's the way Markowitz really created enrichment, today's enrichment has more of this give them something and see what happens and keep trying different things kind of approach, right? That's the way we most of us think about enrichment. And it doesn't necessarily take into account all the ways in which that individual that animal will interact with its environment to produce something. So I think it's still incredibly important that we can't just, I mean, I guess we could, we could just throw out a whole bunch of things and say something will work, right? What do they call that? The uh, spaghetti on the wall technique, right? Throw enough of it and something will stick or the shotgun approach. It's certainly a common practitioner approach, both with animals and humans. The clinical psychologists, counseling psychologists talk about that as well. Just do a whole bunch of treatments, take that shotgun approach, and something will eventually work. But it's not a very efficient way. Mm-hmm. And I think it helps to try to understand certainly the function of that behavior. So why is this happening? And then see if we can change those contingencies in some way. So help me wrap my head around this and maybe you can give me an example. It doesn't have to be mm-hmm. dogs, but maybe some of the animals you've worked with. And, yeah. you know, because when we think about, you know, ABC contingencies, you know, we're often thinking like right in that moment. So I want to get a dog to sit, you know, and the, the consequence is the, the dog getting the treat after their butt hits the ground. That's what we're often kind of wrapping our head around when we're thinking about like a positive reinforcement contingency. So what about right. though when we're talking about enrichment and if we're incorporating and we're looking at the behavior change, we're often thinking, okay, tomorrow or later on in the day because the dog had some nose work or something. So we've incorporated enrichment. We're seeing a change in behavior later on. So Kind of help me have, like think that through, or maybe give us an example of where you would see like the behavior change, <laughs> yeah. how we would track that. Yeah, it's funny that you even mentioned nose work there because I have an honor student that's going to be presenting a little later today on some of their work with scent work and nose work, and then there's a doctoral student that I co-supervise that her entire, all of her dissertation work, all of her research, her, she's currently finishing a scoping review. So that's Jade Fountain, by the way, and some of your listeners may know her as well. And I'm one of her co-supervisors here. Um, She's doing all scent work and nose work. We're we're primarily calling it scent work because, you know, nose work is the trademark specific type, but there's a bunch. So I've had to jump into a year ago, my familiarity with what got called scent work was 
way less than it is now. And I still would not consider my, because there's so much, all the Snifaris and then even nose work being a trademarked type of scent work. And there's stuff like Nick Rudder's work and what we've called the Rudder method for doing things like Nick Rudder works with Melbourne Zoo and has training of dogs to for conservation purposes. Nathan Hall down at, at Texas, Texas Tech, him and Erica Furbacher mm-hmm. out of Nathan Hall's lab just had a couple papers published on training dogs to detect lanternfly eggs. So all these things that encompass scent work, boy, there's a lot. But now I'm going to drift away from that. I just wanted to mention <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that it, for me, I, I've been inundated with all of this stuff in the past year, having worked with a couple projects now detailing scent work. And it's a great example, again, of trying to understand enrichment and training and those interactions. But I'm going to go back to this multi-species, to, to the different species. I'm going to drift away from dogs. I've done a bit outside there and give you an example of where enrichment can work, but understanding why it works helps us refine and get better at providing enrichment. So in my doctorate, I spent a number of years working with walruses, about a half a decade working with polar bears, and I spent almost as long working with walruses. Walruses are amazing. They're wonderful individuals. There's not many of them in captivity. They are very difficult, in fact. To provide them with proper welfare in captivity can be incredibly difficult. So that was one of my primary purposes, was just trying to improve their welfare in these captive conditions. I worked with five walruses, five different walruses. I published research with three of them. So one of the things we did was try to come up with some type of enrichment mat, this enrichment device that they could forage on, because we wanted to give them foraging opportunities. A lot of the problems we see with an enrichment often, that's one of the big things is giving animals this opportunity to forage, an extra opportunity to forage. Since a lot of captive problems across many different species are a result of this disconnect between how they would normally forage in the wild and how they're foraging under this condition. That's a big part of how enrichment works. Not always, and there's many, many types of enrichment that have nothing to do with foraging. So I don't want to make it sound like there's your answer. Just go out and find ways to provide foraging for any animal that you ever encounter, and right? But in this case, the walruses didn't have many great foraging opportunities. Well, your listeners probably, if, if you think about what a walrus does in the wild to forage, these large mammals, very large pinnipeds. So they're a pinniped. They're, they're in the same order as seals and sea lions. So they're the Otobenidae is their family. And they're the only ones in that family, by the way, because then you have the other, the seals and sea lions get their mm-hmm. two other families for the pinnipeds. So walruses get their own because they're that weird and that special. <laughs> they live off of almost nothing but clams. So these bivalves that they forage on at the bottom of the ocean floor. Now to get a clam, what they have to do is they're swimming down in, and sometimes in pitch black darkness at the bottom of the ocean floor. So outside of Alaska, Russia, Greenland, places like this, they're foraging on the bottom of the ocean floor. They're running along. They're using these, what people think of as whiskers. Those are vibrissa that they're using to try to find these bivalves, these clams at the bottom of the ocean floor. Now, if you've ever been to a supermarket or an open market anywhere where you've seen live clams, you know this experience. If you go over and you, or you've seen them in the wild, you go over and touch one and they close pretty quickly. For a walrus, when it, when a vibrissa, one of its whiskers, one of the vibrissa contacts, this clam, it has to put its mouth over that clam before it completely closes and then pull it, suction it completely out of that. They do this enough times in a day to maintain, in some cases, thousands of pounds, right? Tons of weight. They can be very big. If, if For people who have never seen a walrus in, up close, they are immense. They can easily be several meters or over over 10 feet in length. So quite a large animal. So what do you do for, to give an animal like that a foraging opportunity mm. in some captive condition? 
Well, I can tell you what some people in the past had done. Ron Castellane did a, a thing where he put a bunch of rocks in a pit and the walrus would have to kind of dig around through the rocks and, eh, you know, okay, but I don't know how much that's really like sifting through sand and looking for clams. So we ended up using these very thick, they were horse stall mats, but they were about a half a meter thick, about, well, not quite that, actually about a third of a meter, about a foot. By the way, I'm using a lot of switching between uh, metric and imperial yeah. because, you know, I've been in Australia for eight months now, so I'm used to saying metric, and then also I'm very American, so <laughs> <laughs> I have to I give everybody, it's like, oh, that's a third of a meter, that's a foot, right? That's how thick these mats were. And we drilled holes throughout them, made this large mat. It was something like, I think it was about a, a five by six foot mat. In the paper I published, which is a Fernandez and Timberlake 2019 paper, it will give the exact size. But it's a mat that was, let's say it's about five feet by six feet. So for non-American audience people thinking metric, it's almost two meters by two meters was the size of this mat and about a third of a meter thick. And it had 25 holes in it. And we put clams and fish and things that they would eat in that. And then we tossed them into the water and the walruses came over and foraged on these mats and would pull. And it worked okay for a couple of the walruses. It, it ended up having some reductions in stereotypies. It For one of the walruses, it increased general activity, kind of things that we wanted to see. By the way, stereotypy, I know you mentioned this word too, and it's worth mentioning. We're just, we're talking about a repetitive invariant behavior pattern, right? So just in case any listeners, it's so something like a pacing. And in walruses, it'll often be a circle swimming, or they might engage in something like a flipper sucking. In fact, Brutus, the big male walrus there at Indianapolis Zoo, often did flipper sucking. So as opposed to Aurora, who was the larger female, she came around and it would do circle swimming. So we had some reductions and it was good, but the, I would say it was modest effects. And then about the same time that we were doing this research, we were doing the research back in 2005, 2006. Right around that time, there were some researchers that ended up diving with walruses in the wild. First time that anybody had gone and seen walruses foraging in the wild. No one had seen that. This was all what we determined about how walruses were foraging were based on things we saw them do in captivity and then our best guesses. This is what we knew about walrus foraging. Wow. We're in the 21st century and no one's ever seen a walrus forage in the wild. And these guys, I always jokingly say they were crazy Scandinavian guys. I think they were... They might have been Danish, but anyway, they were Scandinavian. They went out to Greenland and dove with walruses. Now, walruses are dangerous, by the way. <laughs> if, if that needs, it's worth mentioning. They are dangerous. They went and dove with them. It was okay. They didn't, uh, they didn't get hurt, but they watched them for the first time. They videoed them foraging in the wild, and they saw something no one had even imagined which was the walruses they were watching lifted up their flippers while they were running along the ocean floor. And they started digging with mm. their flipper at the ocean floor as they were moving along. So they were using their flippers to dig. And no one had pictured that. And then even stranger was the fact that 90% of the walruses were using their right flipper to dig. Huh. So, so they ended up actually looking at the skeletal systems of several different subspecies of walruses that they got from museums. And they measured, again, this is, I'm not an anatomist, for any of the pinnipeds, seals, sea lions, walruses, even though they don't have fingers, they still have finger bones in those flippers. They measured those, what are those, metacarpsals? I don't, I don't know, something like Somebody's gonna. Somebody's laughing. There, an anatomist out there is like, no. Um, but so they measured the the bone lengths, and if you didn't know, based on for us, for instance, if I'm left-handed, the bones apparently. I didn't know this until I I'd read this paper. The bones in my left hand, those finger bones, will be longer 
And so they measured this in the walruses, and sure enough, across the three subspecies, 90% of the walruses, the right finger bones in those flippers were longer than the left. So walruses are are just like us at the same rate. They're about 90% right-handed. So flash forward to what we took that information. We now know, we learned while we were doing these walrus studies, we learned that walruses were using their flippers to forage. And we had modest effects with these mats. So now we're taking in some of the natural history information of the walruses. And we said, let's give them something they can manipulate with their flippers. And it looked less natural. And it was something that was already there. But we just took some boomer balls and we drilled holes in them, these large plastic balls. And we drilled holes in them and then put clam bits whole clams actually, and some fish, sardine, things like that, inside the boomer balls, and then threw a couple of them down to the walruses. And sure enough, the male walrus who primarily flipper sucked would grab the boomer balls, hold it in place, and rotate it, and spin it around and pull the fish out. And the female walrus, Aurora, would grab the, the boomer ball, and start manipulating it with her flipper, but she'd start pushing it along the water. And she'd pull it underwater and spin it while she was pushing it underwater. And the young male walrus, there was an adolescent male walrus named Narius, would follow her along and do some little manipulating as well. So they were both using it in ways that was related to how they've evolved, how they naturally forage in the wild, but then also particular to the ways those individuals, that variability for the individual and what they've learned, how they've learned to forage. One, holding it in place and manipulating it that way, the other, moving it along. That's, I think, a great example of the importance of understanding both those evolutionary and learned histories for managing behavior. You create such a vivid picture of it. Like I know more about walruses now than I ever have in my life. But it also shows, you know, we're just scratching the surface sometimes when we're talking about enrichment and, you know, and we have to really do our homework, I guess you could say, of, of learning how it needs to be yeah. appropriate for a particular species and even maybe the particular individual, especially when we start talking about dogs. It's just, um, yeah, there's so much I, I want to keep diving into. But I also wanted to talk about, you know, again, going back to uh, multiple species and the, you know, the topic of aggression, kind of shifting gears here a little bit yeah. too. but. The function of aggression, or just from an evolutionary, going back to the evolutionary aspect of of it being helping species or animals survive, but the levels, you know what fascinates me too, is thinking about how were the types of aggressive behaviors different species. This is, you know, getting, as you were talking, I was kind of juggling some of these thoughts in my head too, like for instance, a praying mantis, you know, (laughs) displaying aggression versus, you know, some other animals that maybe their level of aggression or what we as humans would perceive as a level of aggression in terms of severity or barbaric or grotesque or however you want to label it, it's going to differ so much by species, but it's all meant to survive, right? It's all meant to survive. So so talk us through that maybe for the last, you know, a little bit here and then, and and why it's so important for us as humans to understand, you know, seeing it through this lens of science, but also to understand that, you know, why our dogs might display aggressive behavior and at different levels. So big question, a lot to think about there. Right, but uh, yeah, but right, this, right, this right. This is the way I a ask of, questions. So I just like to get you get you rolling on something. So. <laughs> no, that that's that's great. This is why we have this is why we have such fun interacting and talking. Is because just like we've done before, we think about these things, and it's all these different levels, and it's really fun to try to unpack that and think about that from those different perspectives. So that said, I'm going to start in reverse a little bit and say one of the things that becomes most important for us in understanding aggression is being able to understand those displays. I think all, <laughs> all your listeners, are, I, I would hope, are, are empathetic at some level to this, including the precursors, right? That's incredibly important for companion animals. And those are things, there are 
In most forms of aggression across species, animals will engage in behaviors, they will display certain signs that allow them to be efficient. It's expensive, it is costly to engage in aggression. You can get hurt, it consumes a lot of energy. So most animals will do things to display something, to say, hey, you know, this is what I do before I aggress. And it's important to understand those signs. I ended up learning many of those on the fly by, I ended up working with a big cat sanctuary, one of the first exotic animal facilities I worked with over two decades ago. I worked with a place that Uh, I won't bother giving the name here, but for lack of a better, it was in Texas. It was a big cat sanctuary. They were breeding tigers. Um, It was as close to Tiger King-esque as we can get. And this was one, as somebody who was trying to break into the field and working with exotic animals as a brand new graduate student, I was looking for, this was one of the few facilities I got to work with was, hey, they're going to let us come in and do these behavior change protocols. And we can work with the tigers. Well, I was going into enclosures with with full grown Bengal tigers, so I was I was uh, having free contact with Bengal tigers, including white Bengal tigers. I was having protected contact with some of them as well. I had minimally protected contact with lions, with mountain lions, with leopards, and with tigers. And I had free contact, complete free contact with adult tigers, which is, I strongly recommend, do not do that. It's incredibly dangerous. It's silly. I look back on that now and and I can't think of something. It's one of the dumbest things I can think of that I've done in my my animal career. But I didn't know any better, right? I was trusting the facility and I said, I want to do that. I was very motivated to work with these animals. And I have a long history of being in, uh, somebody who, you know, grew up chasing animals as a kid that I was, I, I've been in a lot of odd animal situations throughout my life, as many people who have worked with a lot of different animals have been. So it wasn't that strange to me. But tigers are incredibly dangerous. So what I had to learn pretty quickly were some of the signs that, that tigers would give, some of those, including warning signs that they may give for an indication that you may see some, and in some cases, it's not even aggression, it's predation. Mm -hmm. I had tigers try to predate on me, (laughs) and I had to learn those signs as well. So whether it's stalking, whether it's it's some of the, the dilation of eyes, the tail flick in a tiger, you see some little things like that. Anybody who's worked with tigers, in any form, protected or free contact, learns the chuff, as they learn with a lot of other cats, where they give this greeting. So that's worth knowing as well. So I had to start learning some of these little signs of what might tell me that there could be some aggression. Now, with tigers, a lot of it is just, there often is not many signals, because it, it can be more related to predation than it is aggression. But dogs give many, many, many signals in many cases. In fact, when we typically see a lot, of, and I'm sure I, I'm, uh, you would know far more about this, Mike, than I would, but I would think that this is where you start to see a lot of the bigger problems with dogs is when we don't see those signals mm-hmm. and they just, right? So you get a yeah. bite and it's, um, but I think a lot of the time, probably what you're more familiar with is that people just didn't read the signals that the signals were being given, but they didn't read those. So that becomes an incredibly important component is just understanding um, from both the species and individual level, what are the signs of aggression? What are what are the precursors to that aggressive response? And I think that's incredibly important. What other part of this did you want to go into for? Uh, yeah, I, I think you're covering a lot of it right now is one yeah, of the most okay. important aspects is the communication aspect and, you know, right. and getting people to understand that, that animals are going to often communicate 
with plenty of signals yeah. you know we see it in like but, but but humans don't understand animals most of the time we see it in yellowstone park all the time right these people going up to moose <laughs> and it's like staring them and not seeing all the signals right. probably not the best right. idea you know because they it's different than something scary like a grizzly bear you know that we kind of know to keep our space but at least most of us do from certain animals <laughs> but that's the interesting thing is that right. i think that's one of the issues with dogs right is that a lot of people are just like let me just go up to every dog and like, they're expected to just deal with us right right incredible right and that's a lot of it is is the education we provide to individuals about learning some of those signs about how to think about how i mean i i can't think of any animal that i ever approach that like i offer them some version of approach regardless of the level of contact it's their choice to interact with me and i think that's that's true of of I don't know an animal person that doesn't do that same thing, whether whether they know it or not. They give the animal the choice to interact because that's such a dangerous situation to take that choice away from an animal, especially a dog. But it's incredible. We see kids learning that, right? Where mm -hmm. children have no idea. They go up, they hug, they grab these dogs, these cats. And then we see the, the, the unfortunate result of that in many cases. Incredibly dangerous. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of that that's very important. I think the, the choices we give, the communication, understanding those signals. So, yeah. And then how do we understand that? How do we define, again, I always look to data. I look to what do we know from research about some of these forms of communication. In some cases, and I don't know how much success you've had with this, Mike, or whether this is something that you or your listeners do. Do you ever work with dogs that you try to give them some type of signal as a precursor to aggression? Or is that something that you would, you would do? Do you mean like a cue that something bad's about to happen or like the or yeah so if you have a dog that is engaging in aggressive behavior mm -hmm. and this is by the way this is this is how naive i am in, in dealing with this with aggressive dogs in under these conditions is there ever a time that you might give them a cue give them a response right so they can opt out of a situation instead of engaging in aggression. So that can end mm -hmm. up being their precursor. So we think of growling, we think of some of the other typical responses that we might see that are precursors, but is there something you might train them to choose, right? So they can do something like, I, I don't know, it could be a contrived response, right? They could do a little bark or something like that. Yeah, we, uh, we do it all the time, technically, when we're yeah. looking at differential reinforcement strategies, uh, if right. that's what you're thinking about. So, you know, teaching the dog an alternative choice. So instead of yeah. lunging, growling, snarling, biting, go to a station, go, you know, sub figure something else out and we'll reinforce that. But we could also cue that or we can make it the environmental cue where that stimulus coming into the picture is the cue to go to station or so there's different ways that we've kind of navigated that issue. But yeah, right. I think that's answering your question. I think that's- Yeah, yeah, going. yeah. That's yeah. getting at some yeah. of it. I was trying to think of something that's a little bit more, like I was even thinking about the, like Ava and Emily's work and mm -hmm. with start buttons and thinking, yes. are there start buttons for aggression that you could sure. train? Yeah. And it's, yeah. right? That's so always something the goal, that right? You, we we want to see yeah. desi you know, desirable behaviors for us humans in what we're observing before we see any kind of aggressive response, because that also keeps the dog less stressed, you know, if we're going to put a label on that. But if we're going to help the dog feel more comfortable, then yeah, we're yeah. going to look at some other strategy for the dog to choose from. That gives them agency and control on the environment, right? Abs yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that yeah. choice and control is such a critical component. And I, that's one of the things that I always find Aside from trying to punish aggression in some way, and we, we didn't even get to dive too much into that, but there's there's people like Nate Azrin who has spent more time studying punishment in the lab than anyone else. And some of the things they found, for instance, aggression breeding aggression, common mm -hmm. saying, right, mm -hmm. comes from a lot of the learning literature itself in how difficult, how, how problematic it can be to try to punish aggression. Yeah. But seeing people punish precursors to aggression, I think that's, to me, some of the scariest stuff that yeah. I've seen where somebody's, you know, dog growls and somebody tries to, tries to deter the growling. 
And I'm yeah. thinking, do you just want them to immediately go to a bite? Uh, <laughs> that seems yeah. like the next step. <laughs> Yeah, right. it's like it's like yelling at somebody for you know just saying something like "Hey, knock it off" instead of pulling out a gun, right? You know, <laughs> right. Like, it's right. like we want them to to say nice things or at least tell us what right. the problem is, rather than going resorting to the to the extreme strategies of violence. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Somebody saying somebody saying "Hey, could you please quit it?" is a lot better than somebody walking into the room and screaming, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and we teach children these things, right? We say, right. hey, what's your appropriate response mm -hmm. for this? And we give them options to opt yeah. out. And the interesting example, the cross-species examples I have for, for things like this, what I've always found interesting and where we see some of the individual stuff are the elephants. And I, I've had mm. lots of protected contact, and then I've had free contact with both African and Asian elephants as well. And it's always interesting. African elephants in particular have a number of species, typical signs they give for things like aggression, ears out, different mm. responses they'll have. There's, It's hard not to see. You see the African elephant, and you're like, that's danger. That's a problem. But I've had some interesting individual interactions, even with African elephants, where they've done things like I can still remember there was an African elephant that I was trying to take a picture of it eating from my hand. So it was grabbing food from my hand. But in the process of trying to take the picture, I was moving my hand around. So the elephant had its trunk and it was trying to follow my hand and it was getting annoyed. Right. And I was not paying attention because I was looking yeah. at the, you know, I was, and it, this was silly. You would think somebody who spent time around elephants would say, oh, but no, I, I let my guard down and I was just not paying attention to the elephant behavior. And the elephant was fortunately, this was a female African elephant, was very nice. So she just looked at me, put her trunk in my face and blew air straight into my face. <laughs> that was her quit it. You know, and yeah. I, I immediately stopped and she grabbed the carrots and ate the carrots and we were all good. But I just thought that was incredibly polite because it was way nicer than grabbing my hand or pulling me off the wall. Yeah. I was on a wall at her at her head height, but there was still it was minimally protected contact mm -hmm. in that case. Very nice precursor to any form of yes. of escalated. A, I won't definitely say definitely nice alternative <laughs> to to <laughs> right. other choices the elephant could have made. <laughs> right, right. So, so to wrap things up here, if you had one word that describes why, and this is from a multi-species perspective, because I could think of words that I use for when a dog is displaying aggression, what they're seeking, yeah. or what the sort of motivation or the function really of of that behavior, that aggressive behavior. But if you're looking at all species, what would be that word you choose? Is it safety? Is it survival? Is it evolution? Is it distance? Yeah. Can I choose two words for the two yeah. big whys? Yeah. Okay. So I think if we think about it as the two big whys, from an evolutionary perspective, it's just that. It's survival, right? It's fitness. So it's survival. It's, it's something along those lines. So survival. Let's go with that. And from an individual level, so from what's being learned, it's escape, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of time, aggression is meant to get rid of something. So it's negatively reinforced. So whether that's, you know, get you out of my territory, get you away from my food, get you away from me, much of the time at the individual level, it's escape. And that's uh, a big point to make when you're talking about using aversives in training and when yeah. uh, that dog is trying to escape that aversive and we're applying it and what they might resort to if if we don't stop. So right. good way to wrap up this show. But um, I do want to give the listeners a chance to hear more about what you're up to as well as where yeah. they can find more information about you. Well, it's usually pretty easy to find me. Um, if you search for me on ResearchGate, if you type in Eduardo J. Fernandez, Eduardo Fernandez into Google Scholar, type it in Eduardo Fernandez Zoo, Eduardo Fernandez Animal, Eduardo Fernandez Dog, Companion Animal, Cat, you'll get lots of stuff that'll easily pop up. I'm easy to find on Facebook, Eduardo J. Fernandez. Our lab is abwall.com. It's the Animal Behavior, Welfare, and Anthrozoology 
Abwalogy Lab. So abwal.com, A-B-W-A-L.com. And that has all the links to me on Twitter, Instagram, there's Facebook, and I have a still relatively new, it's a few month old group on Facebook, the Applied Ethology Facebook group. I also have the Animal Reinforcement Forum there, ARF, but the Applied Ethology group is really delving deeper into both of the evolutionary and learning histories as they are applied to animal behavior. So it's a good way to help you get, as I like to say, bilingual in understanding animal behavior, understanding the evolutionary and learning histories. Mm, I like the way you put that, bilingual. I'm going to have yeah. to steal that for sure. Yeah. Um, and if, as always, folks, I'll be sure to link all of those links in the show notes for you to check out. Eddie, thank you so much. It's been, as always, yeah. wonderful chatting with you. Yeah, no, this is wonderful. This was really great. So thank you, Mike. This is a I'm looking forward to uh, getting to hear more. Great. I hope you enjoyed this fun conversation with Eddie as much as I did, and I appreciate you tuning in to hear more about the science of aggression in a variety of species as well. And don't forget to head on over to aggressivedog.com for more information about helping dogs with aggression. From the Aggression in Dogs Master Course to webinars from world-renowned experts, and even an annual conference, we have options for both pet pros and pet owners to learn more about aggression in dogs. And also don't forget about the Help for Dogs with Aggression bonus episodes that you can subscribe to. These are solo shows where I walk you through how to work with a variety of types of aggression, such as resource guarding, dog-to-dog aggression, territorial aggression, fear-based aggression, and much, much more. You can find a link to subscribe in the show notes or by hitting the subscribe button if you're listening in on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening and stay well, my friends. Thanks for joining me for the bitey end of the dog. If you like the show, please feel free to subscribe, share, and give a rating. And hop on over to aggressivedog.com or the looseleashacademy.com for more information about webinars, courses, and conferences, all dedicated to helping dogs with aggression issues. And don't forget, the Aggression in Dogs conference will be happening from October 22nd to 24th with 12 amazing speakers, all streaming from a television studio in Chicago. It's going to be a truly unique event in 2021.